Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, everyone's involved in a national discussion now, and that is all about Obamacare or possibly Trump care. But today we're not going to focus so much upon the national issue, but something that's very important defining what health care delivery is really all about and what is its distribution. Do we have a shortage in certain areas? Or do we have more than enough elsewhere? And exactly what are we talking about when it comes to health care? Well, there are people who are studying this in great detail, and they happen to be at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy. We have a project manager here with us who handles a program called the Healthcare Openness and Access Project. It's a fabulous tool that has done a survey of all 50 states in terms of exactly how well they deliver health care. And so I'm delighted today to have joining us Jared Rhodes. And Jared, before we welcome you onto the program, I want to direct my viewers that we've got a terrific photograph of you here. But unfortunately, Skype is not operating as well as we'd like to see it. Maybe the Russians have hacked us today. But uh, we've got your voice with us today. And so, Jared, welcome to the program. Aloha, and thank you very much for having me on. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Well, it was wonderful to be with you at a national health care policy discussion recently sponsored by the Cato Institute, and uh, I was just fascinated by the tool you presented. Tell us a little bit about the organization you represent. Sure, yeah. So, I, I mean, I work for, uh, for, for Dartmouth, so that's the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. But this, um, this project was actually uh, done in, con in, in, in conjunction with the Mercatus Center, which is a, another uh, university-affiliated uh, center. It's a poly policy center down in Virginia, right around the D.C. area, and it is affiliated with uh, George Mason University. Um, so between the, sort of between the two uh, uh, institutions, this, uh, this, this project uh, was born. Uh, it's called the Healthcare Openness and Access Project. That's right. Uh, we're going to get into it a little bit, a little bit more. But first of all, we've given our viewers fair warning that we're talking think tank talk. That you and I are policy wonks, and <laughs> I want to give fair warning to our viewers today that we're going to deal with some technical things. But let me tell you this, everyone: it's well worth following uh, because Jared understands through his research exactly what healthcare delivery is in this country. So Jared, tell us a little bit about the HOAP project. Just briefly now, we're going to dive into it more in depth later on. Sure, yeah. So I mean, just as a, as a really high level overview, it's basically we, we did a bit of an, an, an inventory of, of the, the policies and regulations that are uh, in effect at the state level. So we looked at each state we came up with a bunch of uh, uh, measures, a, a bunch of areas that we wanted to look at, and, 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 and what we're trying to do is, is decipher how open are states to uh, provide, uh, allowing patients to seek out care in the way that they feel is best, and at the same time, uh, how open are they to allowing providers and hospitals and doctors and nurse practitioners and, and everybody on the, on the sort of the, the, the producer side to, uh, to, to, to delivering health care as well. Well, um, Jared, so I think that's an important conversation to be having now because would you say that to some extent the national conversation kind of frames it as if health care is all about insurance, that it's all about a national program, but you're looking at a far more complex picture as to what really constitutes effective health care. That's exactly right. Yeah, that really in the last, uh, you know, certainly through the, the, the Affordable Care Act era, the, the Obamacare era, we have really been focusing on, uh, on, on insurance coverage. You know, do, you, do you have an insurance card? But the problem there is that they're just giving somebody an insurance card isn't the same as delivering uh, health care to them. Um, so you, you know, somebody might be covered, but if you if you try to use that coverage, if you try to, you, you may say that you have coverage, but if you try to find a new physician to to take you onto uh, onto that panel, uh, you might have a, a hard time uh, accessing care. If you, uh, you know, you might think that you have coverage, but then when you go to use uh, use it at a hospital, you might find that you don't have what you what you think you do. In fact, um, so at the, wouldn't you agree that? Kidding. Uh, wouldn't you agree that there are probably, in every situation, a myriad of laws, regulations at the state, county, federal level, uh, as well as circumstances that have a great bearing on whether healthcare is delivered effectively, 
these things go well beyond the insurance program. Exactly, yeah, because, you know, we've, we've been talking about insurance at the, at the federal level, the, this, this whole, you know, this notion of this nationwide program, but so much really depends and, and is influenced at the state level. And, you know, knowing or, or at least having a sense that we might, uh, you know, we might be in a, in, a, uh, in a scenario where we don't, you know, can never predict the future exactly and what's going to happen in Washington, what's going to happen with the Affordable Care Act, would it be changed, uh, you know, depending on who's in office. You know, kind of knowing that that um, is going to be a little bit of a murky situation for a while, we decided to take a step back and say, well, well you know what, nobody's really looking at uh, states maybe as, as much as they should. So let's take a look at what regulations and, and, and things are on the books at, at the state level and see how that, uh, that, that could be used to, uh, th that could be a different place to look for, for change. I'm glad you mentioned that because such a focus has been placed upon national policy that we've talked largely in terms of broad strokes. But the reality is, even prior to the Affordable Care Act, states were key players in determining health care outcomes and availability within the states. Uh, in our instance, uh, Hawaii, for example, we had up to 90 percent coverage of all people in a public-private partnership before the Affordable Care Act, and the remaining 10 percent were generally covered by charity. And so it was a system that worked. There were five states that were actually examining Hawaii's health care system uh, as a prototype for their own, and then a sweeping uh, law came into place, the Affordable Care Act, that uh, pronounced from a national frame of reference what should be done across the nation. H what kind of problems did the Affordable Care Act create for individual state programs when it was implemented as a nationwide mandate? Uh, well, I mean, certainly the, there's a big question of, um, you know, to what extent should a state participate in the, in the Medicaid expansion? You know, do you accept that, that money and knowing that it, it comes with the requirement of, of expanding those roles? That, and that's a, that's a really tough uh, question. You know, some people, they look at that and they, they figure, well, you know, hey, it's, it, isn't it free money? You know, you're, you're getting some you're pl north of 95 percent of, of, uh, of, of the match paid for from the, from the federal uh, coffers. But, you know, that, that decreases over time. And so that, um, that, you know, it's tempting to do that now, but you have to think about really the, the long-term ramifications of that in a, in a state budget. And, and, you know, if you're trying to run a state, you know, that, that's a harder decision than a lot of people gave gave it credit to. Um, and so that's why we saw some states really struggling with that, uh, with that decision, um, whether to, you know, expand Medicaid or not. Jared, in a few moments, we're going to go to the actual tool that you are working on that measures health care delivery state by state, and we're going to take a look at what it shows for Hawaii. But first, before getting down to that level, uh, let's just look overall. What, what, in your assessment, were some of the strengths as well as perhaps some of the weaknesses of the Affordable Care Act known as Obamacare? What, what are some of the just major strokes with regard to that? Oh, well, that's, uh, yeah, that's certainly a, 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 a bit of a can of worms, right? And, I, and I've actually been, uh, you know, I've been, I've been fortunate to, uh, to, to duck out of some of the uh, the the day to day kind of you know uh, let me narrow, let me narrow it let me news coverage for let the me last narrow year, it down for the, you uh, yes the election or so I'll narrow it down to you to make it very very narrow and that is in in terms of healthcare delivery of the actual goods to the in, in individuals who need it how well do you think the Affordable Care Act has done across the nation. You know, it it hasn't done anything for cost. You know, some people can argue that it it uh, you know it had a lot of uh, it gave a lot of people coverage, but it, ha it it never really addressed cost at all. And so that that that's that remains a problem. And it's you know it's not terribly impressive to be honest. If if you if you see you know you, you have these like uh, this this like three legged stool right of cost and access and and, and when you have when you, when you focus on on just one part of that, um, with you know, while ignoring the, the sort of ramifications uh, on the other parts of that uh, of, of those connected um, components, that doesn't really bode too well, and it and it doesn't make it a long term uh, program that's very sustainable. And that's what we're seeing right now. You know, we we have we may have added 20, 20 or twenty five million people to uh, to the to to the roles of coverage, but 
what you have to ask what does that mean and what does coverage mean in that in that context and also what did it cost and and there's also the this sort of forgotten person too of of all these people who whose coverage uh who, whose, whose insurance premiums went up as well because there there are certainly uh victims uh so to speak uh, of 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 the uh, the affordable care act as well you know we we like to hear the uh the, the nice stories and and uh, you know, we like to see the, the, the nightly news that, that portrays the, the anecdote here or there where the, there's somebody who uh, had the, the pre-existing condition that, that now they can get the, the coverage for that, whereas before they were excluded. And that feels nice. But what it does is it, it, it really separates and starts to uh, sever uh, the idea of what insurance should be anymore. That's um, right. You know, the, the, pre- the, the pre-existing condition is, is, you know, it's a tough nut to crack. But, you know, with high risk pools, you know, there are ways to get kind of get around it. And but certainly in the, in the long term, what you need is you need a, a an insur- if you're going to call it insurance at all, then you have to it has to be uh, 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 created in some way that that is priced based on actual risk. Otherwise, it, it really is an insurance. And, and we would actually be we're kind of doing ourselves a disservice to even call it that anymore. Once, once it doesn't represent anything having to do with risk and once it's really just prepaid health care um and and even the things that you that you're that you're covered for you you know those things more and more are being uh are dictated to um to, to us to, to as consumers uh, and that's a real problem well you talk about the nightly news as being the source of information about the quality of health care across the country and it becomes anecdotal rather than based upon research. And what I like about your project at the Dartmouth Institute is that you take away the politics, you take away the perceptions that come through the media, and instead you look at the hard data by identifying the actual variables that constitute healthcare delivery and, and measuring them and do so in a comparative way. But first, uh, I, I was uh, interested in some of the uh, research that you've, you've done here that shows that perhaps the reality doesn't fit with our political perceptions. For example, your research points out that, that uh, the states that happen to be the bluest of blue states, like for example, Oregon, may not necessarily have that much leeway and openness in re- re- with respect to their administration of the Affordable Care Act or health care coverage, whereas states that are generally known to be red states, like Georgia, may not be as restrictive as people think. Could you comment a bit about this, about perceptions and politics in terms of what you've actually uh, discovered through hard data? Right. I think that was interesting that, uh, you know, we we really didn't see a a red state, blue state uh, story play out here. Um, I, I mean, I think that uh, I think the red state, blue state thing might be a little bit overdone anyway, because the more we we see national elections uh, r- results roll in, the, the more we tend to understand it as a as an rural wor- an, an urban rural divide or a, you know a county by county uh, kind of divide. But um, you know, e- even all that said, um, you, you're right. We, we we saw some some blue states where you know. Typically, maybe you would associate blue states as, as being more command and control in certain ways, but that wasn't necessarily the case in, 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 the, uh, in the index that we did. But there were certainly plenty of areas where, where blue states did fine. And then by the, by, you know, the, the contrast there, if, if you're operating under the assumption that a uh, you know, red state's going to be all free market, well, you know, if, there, there are plenty of uh, plenty of examples where, where there are some red states that, that they really didn't do too well. And, and you mentioned Georgia. Georgia, you know, was 51st in our uh, in our analysis. We, we of course we included DC, so that's how we get 51. But um, you know, the, so you know, Oregon, a, a blue state, doing a little bit better than maybe you'd think if if this has a uh, you know if our index has an element of freedom assessment to it. And uh, you know, a red state like Georgia doing doing worse. Same thing with uh, Texas. You know, Texas doing uh, you know not so well in, in certain areas. Um, you know, because we we didn't we didn't set out for this to be a political tool. This is definitely well, very good. Intended to yeah, this is intended to be something that um, you know policymakers can reference as uh, right. you know as a thing to get them. So well, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut that ideas. right there for for a break. We need to jump to right right away, Jared. But this is fascinating, and we'll pick up and actually take a look then at the data that you presented in terms of healthcare distribution from the Dartmouth Institute. I'm talking to Jared Rhodes. This is Kili'i Akina. We'll be back on Ehanakako in just a second. Don't go away. 
Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow. Eat yeah. the rainbow. And if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as Senator from the Big Island on the Kona side, and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Welcome back to Ehana Tako, here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm from Lee Nakia with the Grassroots Institute. My guest today is Jared Rose from the Darkman Institute of Public Policy, talking about a terrific tool for actually measuring how well healthcare is distributed, the HOAP. Now, before we go to that, I do want to say thanks to the Think Tech Hawaii team that is here, Jay Fidel and the wonderful group of employees and volunteers who are putting out 30, 35 or more hours of original content every week produced in Honolulu, Hawaii and broadcast across the world. And you can take a look at that always at thinktechhawaii.com. And you can visit my website, the Grassroot Institute. Org. Oh, now back to Jared Rhodes, and uh, again, I apologize that our Skype is not working well today, so we get a wonderful portrait of Jared here as he talks <laughs> as one of our nation's uh, true experts in looking at the actual data. Jared, the HOAP, or, or the Healthcare Openness and Access Project, looks at several categories or indices. Uh, about how many are they, and what are a couple of sample categories? Sure. So there are there are 38 individual measures. So so that would be uh, you know certain uh, uh, an example of, of an individual measure measure is how many uh, you know certificate of need restrictions does a state have or does a state allow medical marijuana for instance you know a, a yes no or or in between some you know some states have in between answers for those things uh, certain exemptions and such. Um, so there are 38 individual kind of questions like that that you can think of. Um, and then we, we found it helpful to, instead of just talking about 38 completely different things, to, to uh, we score them differently, but then we, um, we, we combine some of them into categories where it makes sense. And so what we have is ultimately 10 categories. Sure. Now, Hawaii uh, is ranked in each category, and uh, as I understand the, the index, there's an overall ranking. The rankings go from 1 to 5, 1 being the lowest, 5 being the highest, kind of like an F all the way up to an A one to five, and in many categories, Hawaii ranks very well, four and five, and in many categories, Hawaii ranks very poorly, one and two. And even before we dive into the data itself, is this fairly common to see that when we actually define health care by specific standards, that we find states with lots of ones and twos and lots of fours and fives, and that really, in general, there's no one single character Characterization of how a state is doing in terms of health care. That's exactly right. We, you know, when we we uh, looked at these states in depth, and we found that these states are really all over the map. Uh, no pun intended. The, uh, the there there are, you know you, you could be the leader in one area as a state, and then that the very same state might be in, in the very bottom uh, for the very next category. Um, you know, even we, we're talking about Hawaii. You know, you, Hawaii is uh, number one in, uh, in, a, in one of the categories which looks at uh, the, the, the corporate practice of medicine. In other words, how open uh, is a state to allowing non-doctors uh, organize uh, medical services and, uh, and, and deliver health care like that? And in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a category that's good to be uh, open in because it, it leads to a lot of innovation. And uh, Hawaii actually did very well in that one. Uh, but then if you look to the you know, very next category, something like insurance, where you're looking at, well, you know, how many, how many regulations, how many uh, uh, state-mandated insurance benefits are there, uh, how many uh, 
you know, what does it do for, uh, does it, does it mandate uh, rate review, that sort of thing. You know, what kind of regulations and, and requirements does it levy upon uh, insurance companies who I think would, would be better off if they could, uh, if they could innovate their, for their sure. business models as well. So, and, you know, in that category, you know, you're, Hawaii is 41st. So, you know, it, it can be, you know, a single state could be very good in one area, not so good in the, in the other or, or anywhere That's in right. between. And for our viewers who are from Hawaii or who have a particular interest in how Hawaii is doing, um, it's not really the case, is it, that Hawaii is the worst state for health care, nor is it the best state for health care. What I index number did you assign to Hawaii, if you have that in front of you there, between one and five, yes, just overall? Well, so overall, I mean, if you want to think of it as the as the rank, you know, so first or 51st, because uh, we included D.C., um, you are actually 29th, which is, you know, pretty close to the middle. Right, um, we're pretty much in the middle of the country. But, yeah, now, you were talking a bit about the first index, and that is the corporate index, and, and uh, I thought that was rather interesting, because the, you've simply measured the data, but you haven't interpreted it from any political sense. And I can imagine that when we look at these numbers, uh, people could fall on either side in terms of saying it's a good number or a bad number, but you pointed out that compared to the rest of the nation, Hawaii is right at the very top with four... Set, uh, sets of 5.0, which is <laughs> a, a letter A right at the top in terms of how business has control over medicine. For example, the state allows corporate practice of medicine, in other words, businesses to own medicine, that's 5.0, allows businesses to employ licensed healthcare professionals, that's 5.0, allows non-licensed individuals to own or operate medical practices or medical entities, 5.0, or allows licensed individuals to split fees with non-licensed individuals, that's 5.0. My first question is, is, is this rather uncommon across the nation, this level of corporate control over medicine as a, prof a professional practice? Um, yeah, so, you know, Hawaii really stands out. I mean, there, there, are, there are a number of states, so it, it's tied for first in this one, so there are other mm -hmm. states that, that also got uh, fines across the board, but not many. Um, and so it, it, it does stand out as a, as, as a, as a good thing for, for Hawaii. Now, on one hand, those who believe in free market uh, economies and free enterprise might uh, rejoice that it's possible to own medical practices. But uh, those who look a little deeper and see that these are generally held by large associations of affiliated with the government might not be so happy about that. So w what is the general implication of such a concentration of medical practice in corporate entities? Well, yeah, it, and I, I just want to jump in and, um, and say that, that for, for anybody who, you know, I, I do want to kind of reach across the aisle, so to speak, and, and say, you know, look, if, you, if you're looking at our index like this and, and you see uh, something like what you just talked about with the, you know, like the, the, the corporate practice of medicine doctrine. If you are, you know, into, into policy and, and if you kind of disagree with one of those things or if you think the scale should be flipped because we're calling something good that you think is bad or, and, you know, vice versa, you would have it the other way. We, we also posted on our website, which is mercatus.org slash H-O-A-P, we, we, we posted the, uh, the, the spreadsheet, a sure. very simple kind of Excel, Excel spreadsheet, um, where, where you, can, you can go in and actually change those and, and, and you know, just kind of flip the, uh, the orientation on them because that has the raw scores in it. And, and if you wanted to see, you know, well, how does that change the, the state ranking? You know, it, 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 so it, it can be overwritten. Uh, because, you know, and, and we did that because we want to, we want to be open to the to the uh, the people in the research Certainly. community and the policy Absolutely. community. So so that's um, yeah that's that's the kind of thing. You know, maybe you you don't agree with that that uh, the, that particular category, or maybe for instance uh, an, another one that could be potentially controversial is the whole medical marijuana thing. If you are really opposed to medical marijuana, you think it's a bad thing that a state is open to it. Well, you could go in and flip that around and. And you could uh, you could see what you know what effect that has on your numbers. So that's that's one feature of the of the tool as well. Certainly. Now you talk about direct primary care as one of your indices, and uh, at the very outset, uh, I understand that to be an alternate form of financing m medical care. Could you define that a bit and and tell us a little bit about how Hawaii stands in this one, where we're not really quite um, there at at the top in terms of your measures. 
Sure. So direct primary care, it's a, it's a different form of primary care that uh, is basically a, a monthly subscription, and, and this exists in a growing number of states. It's a relatively new thing, although really if you think about it, it's kind of, a, um, kind of just a new take on an old idea um, that had been crowded out. Uh, it's, it's where you pay uh, just kind of like a monthly subscription, and, and it's, very, it's very affordable. It's something on the order of usually $45 to, to $75. We're not talking about concierge care for the celebrities where it's a you know, $10,000 a month retainer fee. But what we're talking about is a, it's a, a relatively affordable, you know, probably less than your cable TV bill, uh, t- in order to have what is generally offered as a pretty unlimited access to uh, a, a primary care physician in your community. Um, and these, these direct primary care practices, the physicians that, that practice there, often will have all sorts of things that they can uh, do on the spot. Um, they will they will help you. Certainly, uh, they, they will do some. Uh, in, in many states, you can do um, uh, pre- you can dispense pre- a prescription straight from uh, from your practice. Um, if, if if the state allows that, then then that's something that they'll do, which is a huge benefit and well worth the uh, the, the fifty dollars because the the uh, they will give you they will pass along their uh, their discounts. But you know, all the all the regular uh, office hours and office visits. Um, a lot of times people will do little tests and you, know, you can get blood tests done on the spot and you can get other, other, other labs done at, at very, very, usually it's actually included in that 40 to $50 um, uh, monthly fee. Well, Jerry, we're going to have to leave oh, this as a little sampler of your work because of, this has been so fascinating. We've come to the end of the hour and I just would like you to give the website, if you would, at which people can actually dig in and take a look at this, these and other measures. What, what is the website? Absolutely. It's mercatus.org slash hope, as in H-O-A-T. One of the indices indicates that we're fairly low in terms of some of the uh, occupational regulations. For example, we don't allow midwives, uh, as other states do, or uh, we don't have reciprocal uh, exchange of medical licenses with other states uh, to the extent other states do. Given all of that, Jared, I think we're going to be looking at a lot of information. I want to thank you so much for taking the time today. Keep up the good work in giving us objective information. Jared Rose. Absolutely. Thank you very much. My guest, Jared Rose, the Dartmouth Institute.